We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners and Burke Britain Financial Partners. All right, let's talk aged care. The importance of, um, you know, if you think it might be a possibility, start the process with your application for the the care packages, you know, get the ACAT assessment done sooner rather than later because once you start moving through the levels, you know, you get level one, level two, level three, level four, the home care packages at least, they take months and months and months to get through. Like you can't suddenly decide and just uh, chatting with lovely client at nine o'clock this morning and you know they've decided they need to revisit they moved into an aged care village the retirement village i should say and they decided they need to visit revisit the home care stuff but because they've got to rein, reinstate it they're being told it's 11 to 13 months before they'll actually get the home care package granted and so what why is that why is it so well, what's just, with the delay? Is it just because of the volume of people? Is I it think it's partly volume and partly provide, providers and service provision because you can get the aged care assessment task done, you know, so that's that's step one and you have all of them. That, 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 that in itself takes some time. It's, you know, it could be three, four, five, six months to actually get the formal aged care assessment done and classify people at level one through to level four for the entitlements that go with it. That's the home care package at the beginning. But then actually getting a provider, like having providers that can come and provide that home care service, but without getting through to level three, level four, the chances of getting into an actual aged care facility. So if, if you're thinking, and I've been saying this to a lot of our clients in recent times, ones who you know health issues are starting to become a problem, let's start the process. Let, let's just get the aged care assessment done, work out whether we can get level three or level four category. and. Eventually, there will be some financial packages that come to you that you can make use of at home, but you're in the system then, and if you need, need respite care, you can find a home somewhere nearby that can offer a week or two's respite care. I think there's something like 60 days, 60 days a year that you're entitled to respite once you get the packages, but it doesn't happen straight away because, oops, I've got really bad health, I'm looking after my partner, I can't cope anymore, I better get an aged care assessment. You're still a year away, probably. Like before something actually happens, it's really scary. So, start early. All right, you, you've jumped about four steps. <laughs> a thousand ahead. ways. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, that's all good. <laughs> so let's. Uh, we better do a little introduction. So I think this is either episode eighteen or episode six. I really don't know now <laughs> whether they're all in uh, different order. Uh, so I'm Jay Burke, uh, Director at Burke Britain Financial Partners. I'm joined today by Principal and Founder at Burke Britain, Master of All Things Aged, <laughs> Peter Burke. Very personal. <laughs> good good morning, PB. Lo- lovely to be here, Jay, again, and hopefully we can just give a little bit of clarity and a bit of direction to lots and lots of people out there with this discussion around aged care and the complexities and issues with aged care. Yeah, it's always a, it's a difficult one to navigate in a conversation like this because, well, you particularly, having had lots of experience in aged care, it's easy to dive into sort of the strategy of it. So what I thought we'd try to do today was just start with a bit of an overview of uh, why aged care uh, and residential aged care, aged care is so prevalent at the moment. And it's kind of well, it's relatively obvious, uh, yes. the fact that we have a, an, a, aging an aging population. population um, and that... You know, we're seeing many clients and also uh, children of clients thinking about their parents and also themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, you've been in the game now for, well, we've just had our 21st uh, anniversary, Business. but uh, 25, 26 years in. 26 and a half almost now, yeah. So maybe just talk about the prevalence, of, as you've seen it, of, of aged care and resident, residential aged care and also advice around uh, aged care in your time. Well, I think the key thing is that we, you know, over the last quarter of a century, it's a bit scary that I've been in this for more than a quarter of a century, but um, number one, the health systems are so much better, the medical services, medical science are so much better, that people are living longer, there's no question, and the, you know, the average life expectancy of males and females has jumped out by four or five or six years over the last quarter of a century, and on top of that, 
we're realising that there is this fantastic capability of people, government funding to support um, aged care so that you don't have to keep someone who is really unwell in the home and have the carer then get really unwell trying to care for that person when, you know, it's lovely people don't want to give up on their partners, their family members, but at some point in time they need professional help so you can love them, not have to care for them as 100% of the time. And I think that sort of awareness of the fact that aged care facilities now are getting better, and still massive shortfall in funding and massive shortfall in staffing numbers and so on, and one would hope that over the next couple of years a lot of the promises that were made pre-election that there will be really substantial changes to the wages for our aged care workers, the funding of aged care, the, f- the resourcing of aged care broadly so that we can have a much, much greater capability to provide. But scarily, um, we're only at the tip of the iceberg now. Like the next decade, the numbers of people that will be in their late 70s, 80s, into their 90s, potentially requiring aged care for services is going to almost double. Like, you know, the proportion of people that are currently funding taxes to help cover all of this and the proportion of people using it is almost going to flip, you know, instead of 40, 60, it's going to be 60, 40 over the next decade by 2030. So it's pretty scary. We've got to make sure we understand it and we've got to resource it really well. You mentioned before we started uh, recording, or maybe we're recording, I'll, I'll extract it out, but just how it's a difficult area for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's a, lo- a significant life event which creates a lot of emotional uh, uh, concerns for people and, and, and difficulty, but also just the navigating the rules and regulations of aged care uh, assessments and the costs. Uh, and maybe let's just talk a little bit about some of those difficulties broadly and then we'll, we'll get into uh, things like the aged care assessment, the, the rundown of things like the, the, the costs and, and fees associated. Yeah, well I think... Um, the number one, you know, we almost take it for granted because it's something we deal with all the time. But for the, for the uninitiated, the unaware, it's a very confronting thing. And if you, as a um, you know, a member of a family, whether it be your parents or your partner, are suddenly confronting the thought that maybe I, we can't continue to cope with this person by ourselves at home, we might need home care, or the next step is that you know, full-time aged care thing that. Apart from the uncertainty about the financial implications, the uncertainty about the application process, how do we go about it, the uncertainty about what services are provided, even if I do apply, on top of that, you've got that a, a huge emotional impact. So I think it's really important that people don't try to navigate that all themselves. And you know, with our clients, we have those conversations with them way, way, way in advance of the necessity of actually doing something just raising awareness, what we can do to help, how we can go through a process, the little things we can do early, because unless we start early, all of a sudden, when you do need it, it's still a substantial amount of time before you can actually get where you need to get, whether that be with a home care package or aged care provision of of support in an aged care home. So how early is too early? I had the question, when should people consider aged care planning options for themselves or for their parents? Like, when, When do we start and how do we start to think about it? Yeah, well, I think obviously that's a. It depends. <laughs> the answer is it depends. But I think if, if, with um, the, the majority of people with fairly normal aging, fairly normal health situations, you should. If you're getting to the point where sort of in in your sixties, early seventies, and you can so you're still funding life and managing life pretty well, but you can perhaps see like I, you know, <laughs> sixty eight years of age, and my body mechanically is starting to let me down. I mean, Esther and I are already thinking about adjustments to our lifestyle with, you know, double story home versus single no story stairs. home. All that stuff, you know, the things and I think it doesn't mean you are suddenly can you know um, planning to do a big um, let go of a family member and get rid of the problem. It just means that you are logically thinking about stuff. And I think in life broadly If you go through the implications, you look at the possibilities, you consider all the alternatives, knowledge is gold. Like if you start to understand what it looks like, then when you get to the point where you need to start making decisions, you haven't got the whole box and dice to deal with. You've actually worked out the the basic mechanics and the options and possibilities. Then you can start making some practical moves towards getting things working. So... There is no sort of at 70, at 65. But again, if you've got health issues, those things can happen or need to happen much, much earlier. 
and the healthcare system, um, it's called you know aged care, but it does also provide for younger people who might have disabilities, health issues of significant consequence. So it's not really about an age, it's about how you're coping and think being prepared. Like I, I, It's I was never re- too early to understand it. I was kind of relating it to things like retirement planning where we talk about uh, the earlier you can actually start to actually think about it, like yeah. rather than putting your head in the sand and thinking, listen, I'll, I'll worry about that when I get there, at least starting the conversation, thinking about what do I need to do now to prepare? Because you you know as well as I do that uh, you know, if you get a client that gets to age 60 and all of a sudden starts to think about only then about mm. how they're going to fund their retirement, it's... You're getting it, to the, almost to the too late point, aren't you? It, definitely, it's at yeah. the too late point. It's, yeah. it's nearly every... Uh, aspect of people's financial situation the earlier you can at least consider it look at your options think about it realistically not put your head in the sand and think that it won't happen to me i think that's one of the the issues just as humans in general we don't we don't think very uh well over expanses of time so Mm. you you think about how you are today but you're not necessarily thinking how i will be in 20 or 30 years and that's like that's someone else that's someone else that's and going I'm, to st- I'm to. still 30 i'm <laughs> still i can still run a marathon <laughs> ha ha <laughs> i wish yeah it's interesting i was talking to someone yesterday um we we're talking about how when you're inside looking out you still see who you were but when you're outside looking in you said gee that person's aged yes. <laughs> it's a different perspective when it's you looking out yeah when you time. well i said you looked a bit like neil mitchell that was supposed to be a compliment <laughs> as a, a radio presenter but yeah. well, I think the, other, the other side of that pr- the planning and preparation stuff too is just removing some of the baggage of worry like, you know, you know, that little analogy about the lights are off and you're terrified because there's monsters behind you and you're scared to turn around. And then you turn the light on and it's a cockroach in the corner. Like, we worry about so many things that we don't really know. They're not really there yet because we don't know. But if we can actually remove some of that uncertainty, and it doesn't matter whether you're 30 or 40 or 60 or 70, when if you're starting to think about the future and the possibilities, let's remove a lot of the uncertainty. Have a discussion. And then you can work out what needs to be done. And too many times we'll have, you know, people will be talking to us and they're terrified about, oh, I'm going to lose my home. I can't, you know, can't, what if, if going into aged care, I can't, how can I afford it? Well, that is just a, a worry that's a, an irrational worry because you don't know. Once you actually get the numbers, and which we can easily do, run numbers for people, give you some clarity around how it's going to work. And oftentimes, you know, if you're a couple, actually, Financially, you can find some improvements in your financial position because you're suddenly, maybe, you've separated due to wealth, ill health, sampling possibilities increase and so on. What are some of the other concerns that you see clients coming in? Rational, irrational uh, concerns. You then said, uh, oh, I'm going to lose my house. Mm. Uh, I'm not going to have enough income to fund the, the cost of aged care. Is there any other common like, concerns that people come in with that uh, can be... You know, reasonably easily alleviated with some advice. Yeah, well, I, I think one of it is the fact that I don't really want to leave our home and I don't really want to have to put my partner in aged care. All right, well, you don't have to do that. Let's let's apply for, if one or the other of them, maybe both of them are in a position to get some of the, the home care packages. Well, that's a financial support that allows you to access things like you know, people helping to clean, helping to do the gardening for you, helping to keep a customer or sorry, a client in the house, that they they're not forced to leave it because they can't maintain it anymore. And there's one lovely couple live on a few acres out of Bannockburn, and it was tough because the husband had um, a few health issues, and trying to maintain that property was going to be really difficult. But by getting the home care package, they got help with maintenance of the home, but also help with maintenance of the gardens and things. And you know they were able to stay there with with a smile on their face. Didn't have to leave this beautiful home because they were getting some financial support and people coming in to do that for them. So they're, again, they're sort of the, the emotional concerns, not just health concerns. Do I have to at some point put my partner into aged care? Do I both of us need to go somewhere else because we can't cope with this home? What well, stay here as long as you possibly can? And that's one of the big incentives, which is a very big positive of the home care packages. It's much cheaper for the government to fund a few dollars, and they're not cheap, not a small dollar, but a few dollars to keep individuals in their homes, and it is to put them in an aged care facility. So if you can do that and benefit from that, 
stay in your home a lot longer than you otherwise might have with support, let's have a crack at making that work for you. So let's let's talk about that in terms of getting an assessment. So how, how do you actually go about getting an assessment for either an aged care uh, or home care package or mm. potentially moving into residential aged care? Well, it's a fairly standard aged care assessment task process, task process and it's just a matter of contacting Department of Human Services and they send out their, their, their specialist people who come, come to the home and work through the paperwork and there, there's you know, application paperwork which we often will help our clients with but the process is purely being assessed and they assess then at a certain level, level one, two, three, four and once that assessment is in, assessment is in place... So just quickly, that, that, uh, that assessment, is it, is it ACAT or ACAS in Victoria? aged care assessment service yeah i think it well maybe it was the aged care assessment task but it's probably been renamed to the aged care assessment service yes yep. you're, you're right i still use the old acat which that's is okay the task i think you itself. said i think you said department of human service <laughs> too that i think that's now the department of health and human services or no, something no? department of family inclusion and equity or something like that <laughs> okay yeah. beautiful so i'll rename it I for should, some reason i should get with a new world should yes I? you should <laughs> <laughs> um but again that process just getting someone to come along and finish that assessment or provide that assessment takes a long it's not an overnight process because lots of people are wanting it and then once that assessment is actually formalized and they classify the individual or couple at a certain level one two three or four it then requires a provider to come in and provide the services. So the granting of the dollar value for the package, then getting a, a service provider, and that's all outsourced. Most of it's outsourced to private groups um, who then you need to get somebody who suits you in your area that can come along and provide those services. And I suppose the layer beyond that is the actual home, aged care, you know, um, an aged care home for one or the other as well, which, again, you've got to have a spot available. And sadly, there's someone has to leave that, that bed, that room, you know, p- pass on before a spot becomes available. So the earlier you can get things in place, the better. You were talking about that. I'm, again, I'm not sure whether that was before we hit record, but just the, the length of time that we're seeing it take for people to get placement or for to get assessed and then get placement, it, another oh, reason why you should be starting the process as early as you possibly can. And yeah, getting well, advice as soon as you possibly can. A perfect example. I chat to a lovely client this morning, and um, he and his wife are now in a retirement village. But prior to that, they had the aged care home package, which they were using at their previous home. And then when they went to the retirement village, they chat, decided they didn't need it. They downsized a lot of the services provided, but they now realise, due to health, health issues, that they do need it again. They've apl- gone back to ask for it to be reinstated, but they're being told it's 11 to 13 months. Like, and they've already been in the system. They've already had the assessment um, and significant health issues. So you can't you can't leave it until it's too late. You've got to prepare early. Let's talk about uh, one of the the common queries that people have around the costs of of aged care. And I've I've noted a couple here, but maybe let's talk through uh, the, the the fees associated with residential aged care. The basic day. F- uh, daily fee, uh, the accommodation payment, the means-tested fee, and sort of other service charges. Let's yep. let's go there. So. Yeah, well, just quickly first, though, when there are there can be um, some daily fees if you have the home care package. They can quote you a daily fee, but quite often that's it's a modest amount. But quite often that is absorbed into the package. So when a lot of our clients are being told, oh yes, there's an aged care, sorry, a home care package available, it'll cost you this much per day. But that is the maximum it can cost. And if you happen to be getting benefits like Centrelink or whatever, that often is not. It's waived and the the package can be, it might be nine grand a year, 15 grand a year, 50,000 a year, depending on your level. And most of that is absorbed. So you don't normally have a huge cost, although it'll be quoted at the beginning. But when you have to go into aged care itself, there's the standard fee which everyone has to pay, which is just the. Let's try and get the terminology because I know there's <laughs> lots of lots of different uh, yeah. terminology for each of these. But let's let's start. So that you're talking about the basic the basic daily fee, yep. yeah. And in essence, it's set up as if you've got nothing, and so for the person who has got nothing except surviving on the age pension, it's uh, the equivalent of around about 75, 80 percent of the single age pension. So around about 18,000 a year, which comes back to about 
I think it's $51 a day. Oh, I tested you there. I printed it out. So uh, <laughs> as of uh, March to June 2022, it's fifty four sixty nine per day. Okay, the fifty four sixty nine a day. Yeah. And you multiply that by the 365 days of the year, it comes in at around about three quarters of the single age pension. The, the, the premise behind that is that even if you are totally financially destitute and all you get is the age pension from Centrelink, you're a single person with the age pension, you can afford to be in aged care and there's a bit left over to cover other things for you. So the other benefit is that if you are a couple and one of you has to go into aged care, you then both move to the single rate pension due to separation due to ill health. So whilst as a couple you might be on about maximum 720 a fortnight each, Single rate, if you're separated due to well, health, jumps up to about 9.30, 9.40 a fortnight each, which, again, easily covers that basic daily fee. The second fee, which has to be calculated, and we've got calculators we can do that for all of our clients, is the means-tested fee. And as it says, it's the means-tested fee. It depends on your means. And, you know, it can be a bit scary. You think, oh, this is going to be a huge cost. But when we do the numbers, especially if it's a couple and one person goes into care, only 50% of the assets are counted. The home is removed from the assessment, so that doesn't count because someone needs to stay living in it. It doesn't end up being prohibitive. So just let's just explain some means testing. Uh, uh, you said it's based on people's means, but yep. explain what means testing actually is. Okay, so if I've got um, if I've got a million dollars worth of financial assets, which include things like superannuation, pensions, and so on, share portfolios, managed funds, bank accounts, and if I happen to have an income stream, like I might have a defined benefit income stream, they do count uh, as part of all this means test. What income you receive from Centlink at that time, if you do receive any. So it's a combination of an income assessment and an asset assessment. And from that, the formula just works out what you can afford to pay without having to deprive you or have you, you know, get rid of all those assets. So it is your means, your asset value. And it doesn't count things like your cars and contents, like those things that are just personal assets. But any financial assets are included in the means test. If it happens that you... Um, are a single person and you go into care, the home, the family home is assessed as part of that total means testing calculation. But there's a cap which at the moment is a give or take 170,000. So there's a, no matter what the home is worth, they only include in the means testing fee. It's you know, plus or minus, it's marginally above or below 170. It was about 167,500 a little while back. I think I've got it. It's uh 178.839. Okay, it's gone up a little bit, yep. yeah. So it's um, that figure, and again, and with home values these days, most of them are worth a lot more than that. So that figure is used for the means tested fee. Is there a cap on the means tested fee? Yeah, that's great, great point, Jay. That's why a lot of people get worried because when we do the means testing, when we do the calculations, I should say, it could it could come in that the client might potentially pay thirty or forty thousand a year if they're fairly well off in the means tested fee. But there's an annual cap and a lifetime cap. And so the annual cap is give or take 27 grand. Again, I don't, can't quote the exact figure. I, I can quote it for you. So the <laughs> annual cap is uh, 29,399, 40. Yeah, yep. okay. so 29,399. So if, if my daily fee, my daily means tested fee is going to give a cost of 50 grand a year, for example, when you get to that $29,000 figure, it stops for the rest of the year. But the second, um, really, uh, it's a positive, a positive negative in a way. But there's also a lifetime cap. And so the lifetime cap is something close to 70 grand, probably. You're getting pretty close, $70,558. Yeah, and so if I pay 29000 year one and 29000 year two, about a third of the way through year three, I'm going to reach my lifetime cap. And so the means tested fee then stops as long as that, as long as that individual, st individual stays alive in that aged care facility, they do not pay the means tested fee again. And I suppose it's a sad, sad indictment on, on ageing, but the average life expectancy of a person in aged care is two to three years. It's about two and a half years. So that, that calculation is based on the average person living for the amount of time they might be in aged care. But it can't possibly destroy your financial well-being that's the key it, it's it protects everyone's financial situation 
All right. We've covered basic daily fee. We've covered the means-tested fee. Let's talk about the accommodation payment, which obviously uh, gets people concerned when they see yeah, the, the quantum of, uh, of, of lump sum that maybe they have to come up yeah. with. And that, that's now called the refundable accommodation deposit, RAD, as the RAD, RAD is the term we use. And that figure varies from home to home and it varies from room to room in a home, depending on what sort of room you might want. I was going to say, what, what people ask, why does that vary? Why, why, mm. is it, why does that, that lump sum amount that they quote the RAD, yep. uh, why does it vary so much from facility to facility? Okay, well, if you go to a, a country town and you've got an aged care facility in a country town, it's sort of loosely based on property values because if someone has to go into care, you know, give or take, what's, what's it worth if you took the value of your home and put that into an aged care home room? So, you know, as country towns, it could have sort of ranged 250 to four or 500 in Geelong. Um, I think it usually starts off at around about 350, runs up to about 600. But if you went to Sydney, you could pay a million dollars for that rad. So... I think there is, and when, when this was set, a, set up by the federal government a handful of years ago now, this fairly clear um, script or you know calculations and all these things, I think if the figure was in excess of 500, and it's probably higher than that now, the home itself, if they wanted to charge more than 500, needed to get approval for that. So they needed to be, you know, explain why it needed to be more than half a million dollars. That's probably quite a bit higher now. But the point is that you don't have to, go to a home and pay five or six hundred and even in the home itself there you know there are a lot of the Geelong places you can pick something at 350 400 450 500 600 depending on the quality of the room you know there might be a lovely place like the um, um, multicultural aged care center over in North Geelong have beautiful rooms with their own little en suites and own little kitchenette areas with doors that open out into a little garden area, you can put garden furniture outside. They're a bit more expensive because they're, you know, like they're for people that probably are not um, needing 100% high level care. They're still a little bit independent. But then, you know, if, if the person going into care is not going to benefit greatly by a lovely little outside garden, well, you can still have really nice rooms because they have fantastic shared facilities and all the stuff that's done in the aged care facilities to entertain provide social contact companionship they have great facilities so the choice would be up to the individual person family members about what level of rad they might pay but sorry question no i was just going to say one one of the things that you mentioned earlier is uh, one of the concerns that people come to us regularly is how the hell am i going to fund that they see that lump sum amount yep. that that rad the refundable accommodation deposit amount of five hundred thousand dollars and they think Shit, how are we going to fund that? Spot on. And I think that's the, the beauty of it is they're very flexible. And so there's a range of ways. You can do a daily accommodation payment instead of the lump sum refundable accommodation deposit. So let, let's <laughs> just slow down on that one. So the, we've got the, the RAD, which is the lump sum payment. If you choose to pay it in a lump sum, yeah. you can, however, pay a, a daily accommodation payment, which reflects what? It's just an interest rate on the... Um, so let's say the figure we chose for... The room we chose is going to cost us half a million dollars. Well, if you haven't got half a million dollars in hand at the moment, you can say, well, I, I won't pay the half a million, but I'll pay the specified, and it's government regulated, the specified interest rate, Do which you is... Do take a guess at what it is? I reckon it might be 4.75 or 4.8% at the moment. Okay, well, I've got it at 4.07 uh, as of the... For residents, residents entering into aged care, 1st of April 22 to 30 June 22. Okay, uh, good. That well, obviously, it didn't go up with the recent rate rise, which is pleasing. I had a thought that it was around four and a half. And tipping it, it probably will after the end of the quarter. <laughs> yeah, quite yeah. possibly. But if you, if at the moment that interest rate, which is a bit more expensive than you, what you might earn on money in a you know, term deposit or a bank account, but if you haven't got the money and you want to do this for a period of time, then that interest rate is a way of not having to suddenly sell a home or relinquish a whole heap of uh, financial capital at a bad time. So it gives you some choice. But the in-between option is to say, well, I can put down a partial lump sum and I can only pay interest on the residual balance. But also there's great flexibility in the aged care system. Just because you make a decision at the beginning of your tenure in an aged care facility, you can put more against that lump sum amount at any point in time. So that gives the opportunity to say, well, I don't want to sell the home in a hurry. Probably happy to sell the home, but let's take our time, make sure we get the price, present it as well as we can, 
will happily pay the daily accommodation payment interest cost daily, weekly, monthly, until we get the funds from the sale of the home. Then we can take it in and pay, pay off the balance or some part or all of the refundable accommodation deposit and remove that interest cost. Now, it's in the name of the, the deposit, refundable, <laughs> but just to explain what happens at the end of uh, someone's uh, time in aged care, they've, they've passed, uh, what happens to that deposit? All right, again, if you use that, you know, the example, half a million dollar RAD, um, at the point the person passes, it comes back directly to the estate of the deceased and there's no money taken from it. You know, going back, you know, so many time flies, six, seven, eight, nine years ago now, since this new system was introduced, there was a proportion of the, the accommodation deposit that was kept by the facility, but that's no longer allowable. So whatever number is put down as the refundable accommodation deposit, every dollar of that comes back. You lose the right to use it, obviously. The home aged care facility uses it for their benefit. Uh, but when the person passes, it then goes through the estate. Now, are there instances where the RAD is not required? So where the RAD is not, someone uh, doesn't have to pay that accommodation deposit? Absolutely. Well, we have, we have um, funded situations where a person might have not have means, and so the Commonwealth Government, the, the rules allow there to be some assistance with that. So if you're an assisted resident and there, that's um, again a calculation that's done at various levels but look the, the individual must be left with a minimum amount in cash reserves and I think that figures just under fifty thousand dollars that they must be allowed to keep um, they can't be asked to put that sort of money into their care costs um, so if a person for example had just a bank account and the age pension they would not be required to pay the RAD. They wouldn't pr probably have any means-tested fee. They'd hand over that 75 80% of their single-age pension. And there are a number of spots that the aged care facilities are required to have for funded, supported residents. So a person who hasn't got anything can't be denied access ahead of someone who might be able to pay the RAD. The ex it's, uh, those, those extra costs are basically covered by the federal government. How many, do you know, have figures on how many supported residents a, a facility has to have? Oh, that's a good question, mate. I don't. Yeah. No, I don't. But I think there's a proportion. And again, um, the, even private facilities, if they're, going to, if they're getting government support, government funding, are required to offer support places for supported residents. So, you know, if it's a fully uh, government-funded facility, there would be more. And the private facilities, probably not as many. But in order to get any government support, there is a requirement that they do provide positions, places for supported residents. And, you know, we've done a number of situations where, where you've got a couple, we've done the numbers, and because of the assets that have to stay in the ownership of the person who isn't going into care, they almost become a fully supported resident. And because the assets that are ignored, like the family home is ignored if one person needs to stay in it. And 50% of the assets that they have as a couple are still left in the name of uh, not used for that assessment. So if you do have to have um, you know, some share of the costs, it would become a daily cost, which still sits inside the capacity to generate income without having to hand over a big lump sum. There's a, there's a fourth... Uh, schedule of fees in some instances and uh, I think it's called many different things additional charges extra services charges what mm. what do they cover well, if, for example you wanted to um, have a, a weekly hairdo <laughs> like you wanted to have a, a weekly service that's a bit outside the normal care that's provided by the home if they wanted to have you know somebody coming in on a regular basis and providing a little bit of extra pampering for the person if they wanted um, to well, there's some things like medications and so on are obviously a cost above and beyond, but it, there's a, a lot of the homes will offer extra services and they vary from home to home. And you it's can kind of the bells and whistles. Yeah, you can pick and choose the bits you want. And again, it really depends on the, the health of the individual, the capacity of the individual to get benefits from those extra services, whether the family feel that they're worthwhile or not. Some of that stuff can be provided privately by the family. You don't have to have them scheduled by the home. So it's, a, again, a very variable, but they're available. And those costs are not massive, but that is an extra cost that you can choose 
it's not mandated, it's an option offered by the home. Now, having been in the aged care space for a while, I'm sure you've got a couple of stories of, uh, without naming names, obviously, mm. uh, of uh, situations gone bad where people have maybe made uh, bad decisions around aged care that have got themselves into trouble. The, the, the few that I can think of are people trying to preemptively move around property mm. ownership yeah. to to try and benefit themselves uh, in the future. And then on the flip side to that, maybe some uh, scenarios of aged care outcomes that have happened or, or worked out pretty worked well. Out really well. Yeah. Yep. I think that the, the thing you need to be very careful about is if you're starting to change the ownership of assets to try and minimise what you might have assessed against you before aged care happens... There's a five-year look back. Any anything that changes ownership has got a five-year um, gifting. It uh, remains assessed against the individual for five years if you've given it away. If you give it away for an unrealistic amount, then it's a deprivation calculation done because you're actually depriving yourself. And so, situations like that, we find where that's been done two, three, four years ago to try and in, in not the right way, try and anticipate and be prepared. All that does is that you've got and lost an asset, but you still have to have the expenses that are calculated because that's a it creates a negative possibility or negative situation completely. And the other thing that often um, a lot of families think they're helping, uh, where the the children, for example, of the the person going into care will say, "Look, I'll fund, I'll fund the uh, the bond, the ref- refundable accommodation deposit for you, just so that it gets we don't have to worry about the cash flow cost." then over time, but the problem with that is that that removes it from you, the gifter, you've lost that asset because the asset then at the deceased person's passing belongs to them. That moves into their calculation, or sorry, into their estate. But the second disadvantage of that is that you're actually, you may well be paying something that you don't need to pay because if you haven't got the capacity to pay that refundable accommodation deposit, you could well be an assisted resident. And so, you know, that's why, again, being careful, don't make any major financial decision without checking before you do because you can actually create almost an irreversible negative if you do it badly, do it the wrong way. I didn't mention at the beginning, but I had there noted, like the estate planning considerations which you've just mentioned, it's, it's not only the considerations in the lead up to and when someone's in aged care it's what's the flow on effect beyond that beyond them yeah. no longer being with us that might uh, might have some adverse impact and again I know we, we say this ad nauseum but get advice early go and seek advice early yeah. talk to someone and start considering the implications and you'll be in a better position on the flip side uh, good outcomes that you can think of we've had a, a great outcome with people with aged care yeah well, I think there's a really good examples of where if you do have a conversation in advance and, and can prepare um, correctly if you can put yourself in the right position in anticipation, then we can, we can in some instances, significantly r- minimise the costs. Um, uh, just an example, you know, if we've got um, a person who's still, a member of the couple that's still under age pension age, well, if we move any allocated pension money into the name of that person and have it in the name of that person in super, not in pension, it remains a non-accessible asset like the family home if someone has to keep living in it. And so there are many ways that we can actually, you know, legally, correctly, creatively manage things. And I had one client who um, ended up going into care after a bad stroke and we adjusted significantly where all the assets sat and he became a fully assisted resident. And it was, yes, he had his the small, small, very small um, fee on top of the the basic fee, but it was well manageable. And the original calculations that probably end up saving at least a thousand dollars a month of fee costs by just getting the assessment, getting the figures right before we provided the the final assessments to the aged care facility. So there's always ways to try and improve it a bit, and sometimes it's impossible to improve it, but just making it clear that it's not going to be prohibitive is also not a bad outcome. Running the numbers, doing the modelling and saying, this is more than manageable. I just did some calculations for another couple in anticipation of, sadly, the husband's suffering um, dementia, which is running downhill a little bit too quickly as it does. 
And when we went through the figures, this couple at the moment are not entitled to any age pension. But in anticipation of one of them having to go into aged care, becoming separated due to well health and having the really nice thing is from a Centrelink perspective, the refundable accommodation deposit, that lump sum, becomes a non-assessable asset like the family home. So we will be in a position with this couple when they decide it's right and time to pick up two-thirds of the age pension for he and her. It's a sad situation that's created it, but financially that's a, a really positive outcome because the large part of his costs then will be covered by an age pension entitlement that they, know, they haven't got at the moment, they're not entitled to at the moment. So again, it's, uh, there's lots of possibilities that you don't need to freak out about. Um, have a chat to us. Let's have a look through the numbers and model it and we can give you some comfort and clarity. Well, it's a good way to wrap it up. Maybe just in closing, uh, any advice to those seeking guidance? You've said seek advice early. Uh, any other advice without being specific advice to people's circumstances? Uh, what, what, what do you say to those people who are, are in that position where they're thinking about uh, either their parents or themselves and uh, either home care, aged care? What have you got to say to them? Well, I think um, probably even <laughs> very easy for us to say come and get advice from us because that's our business and what we'd like people to do. I think the best thing people can do is find someone who's actually gone through that aged care process either with advice or without advice and just listen to their conversations and the stresses or lack of stress, the removal of stress, that getting advice, getting support has provided for them. And you know, we had a lovely referral came into us through last year. The couple, Geelong couple, but mother of one of them lived interstate and it was a really difficult thing because they were a fair way away and she was having to go into aged care. Well, they sat down with us and, and within you know four or five weeks, we were able to run all the numbers, put all the things in place. And the, the upside for them, if, you, if anyone spoke to that couple, they just keep raving about how thankful they are, both still working, still challenged by life in many, many ways. And the emotions of being distant from a parent who's going through really bad health and the thought that they needed to put this parent into aged care from a distance, flying backwards and forwards interstate to do that, those stresses and time costs alone were massive. But to say, well, look, we'll let you guys sort out the financial stuff. Tell us how to make this work as best we can. And yeah, the house, they thought, they thought that they'd have to sell the house in a hurry to have the money. That, that was their immediate thought when they came into us. Well, I know we've got to sell the house. We need the money in a hurry because we're going to have to put mum into aged care. Well, no, you don't. And when all of a sudden we took that time pressure away from them, they ended up selling the house still and they used it to fund the deposit. But um, it was a much, much better outcome because they removed a huge part of their worry bag. They just dropped it on our table and went away and worried about the things that mattered to them, the emotional stuff. So, Very good. Well, let's, let's close it out. Let's wrap it up there. Thanks, PB, for your time. Uh, it's always good to let you off the leash and <laughs> just start to talk about uh, things that you've got lots and lots of experience on and I think as you said like talking to people that have had experience in the past is is critical I know we've got plenty of experience in this office in aged care and even the purpose of this podcast is to have something that people can share so if you're listening to this podcast and uh, you know someone who could maybe benefit from uh, listening to how aged care works or they need to talk to someone who's got some experience then then, then pass it on share share the love and uh, uh, have a listen so thanks again pb uh, look forward to you being on uh, the next episode my pleasure mate thanks for the time it's good fun chat any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, listeners should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right, hit it. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility, do your homework, ask questions, and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PB Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading is Burke Britain Financial Partners are authorised representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.